Previously on the Carbide Cruiser series, we developed the toolpaths for the top of our longboard deck. Today, we're going to tackle things on the other side, the deep pockets of our deck's daunting underbelly. This side poses a greater challenge than the upper side because of the sheer volume of material we need to remove. Over a kilogram of aluminum, in fact. That's going to require us to use a very reliable toolpath that we can trust for hours at a time. And you know what that means, right? Adaptive toolpaths. But before we can do that, I want to face down my stock to a consistent thickness. So I first applied some facing and surfacing toolpaths to the bottom of my longboard deck with a 203 cutter. That would bring us down to the 0.45 inch final thickness that I designed the board to, and leave the outermost face with a nice clean surface finish. Next, I would slather on a number of adaptive roughing operations over different areas of my board. The first would be around the inside of the board. Initially, I just applied my adaptive toolpath with a single containment boundary. This resulted in an 8-ish hour toolpath that was just unwieldy and not very user-friendly. If I ever had to stop my toolpath for any reason, there would be no easy way to restart things without a lot of wasted time cutting in air. Later, as I iterated on my longboard design, I would learn to segregate my adaptive toolpaths by area, machining just a few pockets at a time. This way, if I only had a few hours in the afternoon, I could run a program that would fit my schedule. Then I would turn my attention to the outside of my board. With the stock option set so that the tool could come in from the outside of the board profile, not only would the toolpath be able to skip ramping in, but it would also be able to spend most of its time engaged in the material for maximum efficiency. After roughing everything out, I would then have to clean up all the surfaces, and because there were so many contours and features with weird intersections, I found that the easiest way to clean up my walls was to select a boundary and let Fusion touch whatever it wanted to with a 3D contour. For the flat surfaces, I wanted to exert a little more control, so I used 2D pocket operations. And here, I got myself into a bit of trouble, because if you click the wrong contour, Fusion will direct your CNC to blindly charge forth and try and machine out a pocket in the given contour, even if there's material in the way. It's not model aware like a 3D operation is. You'll see later just how spectacularly that came back to bite me. After roughing and finishing all the horizontal and vertical faces, I would then attack all the remaining non-orthogonal surfaces. This meant using a 3D contour with a ball and mill around the undersides large chamfer, and some 2D chamfer operations to break all the other edges on the board. The goal was to have the deck not feel sharp or uncomfortable in hand. Now, to actually machine the underside, the first challenge is to flip the deck over and align it, and the best way to do that is with indexing pins. I machined out the mounting pattern of my trucks with holes that would accept 3 16 inch dowel pins. Then I flipped the deck over and secured it with some double sided tape. First things first, 203 cutter for high feed rates doing a facing and finishing pass on the top surface. Next the 278 quarter inch single flute. My typical recipe for aluminum which I've refined over time targets a chip load of two thousandths of an inch per tooth a depth of cut of 0.07 inches, and an optimal load of 25 thou. However, for the sake of reliability and to assuage my anxiety about the machine running for hours at a time, I backed off on my depths of cut, both radial and axial, by 10%. I'm also employing a 10 thou fine step down on the outer toolpaths to reduce the stair step texture left by the roughing toolpath. Though it adds a little bit of machining time, it makes things a lot easier for the finishing toolpaths like my chamfering and 3D contouring operations. The more material you remove now, the less cutting forces you'll have later on. Now, one thing I should mention is that aluminum can bend as you machine it. Just like in wood, there are internal stresses that can become unbalanced as you remove material. If I wanted to guarantee that my stock wouldn't peel off my table as I was machining away the middle, I would drive some screws through the truck mounting holes. But luckily, that wasn't necessary as everything worked out here. Once all the roughing was completed, I paired back the excess stock to leave with some pocketing and contour toolpads, and then went over the last couple thou of material with a light finishing pass. Once that was done, I used the 202 ball end mill to finish the 30 degree chamfer around the outer edge, and then used a proper 45 degree chamfer cutter to break all the other edges. I was pleasantly surprised when my first attempt at machining the longboard deck completed successfully, but just to make sure it wasn't a fluke, I wanted to machine a second and third deck. You know, for science, it's gotta be repeatable. And here, I thought I would be clever and elevate my part for more rigidity. Because the further your tool contact point is from your mechanical interfaces like the spindle mount and V-wheels, the greater the moment arm is and thus torque. 
tool stick out and even router stick out make your machine weaker. So I wanted to shorten up that stack as much as possible and squeeze more performance out of the Shapeoko. And it did help. Machining was a little bit smoother. Some places where I used to get vibration, the Shapeoko was now humming along normally. But there was an unintended consequence. On deck number two, midway through the main adaptive clearing sequence, I noticed that I had lost a few steps in the z-axis, and some of my pockets were ending up shallower than expected. I aborted the program, shut off the machine, and started troubleshooting. I moved the z-carriage up and down by hand, and I noticed the spot where it seemed to be getting stuck. The proximity of my cutter to the z-axis meant it was a lot easier for chips to bounce up and stick to the v-wheels, and an aluminum clot had formed on one of the lower v-wheels here. This was undesirable, so I fashioned a little chip guard out of masking tape to reduce the exposure of the V-wheels. Cutting proceeded smoothly from that point onward until I got to the final pocket finishing toolpath. Remember how I mentioned that 2D pocket operations are dumb? Well, somehow, in my contour selection for this finishing operation, I had picked a profile from the other side of the board, one of the grip tape inlay pockets. I didn't see this because toolpaths inside geometry are obscured. You have to toggle wireframe mode to see them, and I didn't do that check. So when the machine blindly tried to follow those instructions, it ended up crashing into my walls at full depth. My GoPro was in time-lapse mode when this happened, but you can still make out the CNC pinballing around the inside of my Carbide 3D logo pocket. I wasn't in the garage at the time that this happened, but I was within earshot, so when I heard that terrible grinding noise, I raced over to the machine and killed the power. The damage to the part was quite severe. Multiple walls had been chewed up, the Carbide C was unsalvageable. I was left with the question of what to do with this deck. I had about 13 hours invested in this piece and I really didn't want to scrap it. So I pivoted and decided that the logo would be done as an inlay. I would machine away the damaged parts and figure out how to fill that space later. And so I continued along with my machining, just a little disappointed at what had happened but still optimistic that I could recover from this. But when it came time to do my 3D finishing around the board's profile, disaster struck again. It would seem that I hadn't sufficiently tightened down on my collet and my ball end mill was starting to slip, cutting deeper and deeper until it pulled out to the point that it punched a hole through the outer profile of my longboard deck. This was a massive facepalm moment and it really bothered me because there would be no way to hide this goof without altering the overall shape of the deck. And since I had already designed a kicktail and tool pads that this profile blended into perfectly, I wasn't about to start designing a new board shape and creating tool pads for it. This scar would be here to stay as a permanent reminder of my mistakes. However, I could mask part of it by increasing the size of my chamfer, so I did that at least and a lot of the gash was erased. Fortunately for my sanity, the final bit of chamfering went off without a hitch. After all these issues, I really needed the third board to just work. Having to constantly adjust and adapt to problems and mistakes was really taxing my patience, and thankfully the Shape Oko delivered. Over the course of nearly 40 hours of machining, I learned how to maximize the endurance of my CNC, some things to look out for in Fusion, and things to double check in my machine setup. Developing a reliable process is about working through unexpected problems and learning from your mistakes, and this part taught me a lot. But now I have G-code that I have complete confidence in, and if you're running a business and making the same parts over and over again, that is worth a lot. In the next episode, we'll be moving on to the kicktail, which will be even more challenging from a technical perspective, but less time consuming, which is a big relief for me. Until then, good luck and have fun with your own CNC projects.